he went one of his went as the head of the power sector unit for the World Energy Outlook at the International Energy Agency, IEA. Uh, last year in 2021, he led the electricity modeling part um, of the World Energy Outlook 2021. And more importantly, he was the lead author of a really great report that's highly relevant to the topic of this workshop. And it is called Net Zero by 2050, a roadmap for the global energy sector. So I think that's a, that, is, that is extremely relevant. And, and when, when I saw this report and I, and I, I met uh, Brent uh, last year in a, uh, in a uh, working group meeting uh, in December, it struck me that, wow, well, this, is, this, is, this is great. I, I, I wish, uh, even back then, it sort of the idea came, up, came to me that we should have Brent uh, invite, we should invite him to give a talk at an upcoming workshop. I didn't know about this workshop yet, whether this workshop was going to work out. But uh, so this is, this is really great to have this event and have him join us today. So Brent uh, has been working in this for many years uh, and uh, for, for more than a decade now at the IEA in Paris. He's also contributed to a total of 11 world energy outlooks and 16 additional deep dive reports. So, so you can see he has, a, he, has a, he has a highly relevant expertise, a long, uh, a lot, many years of experience in this, in this field. And so we're extremely fortunate to have him be able to join us today. And, uh, he's, a busy, he's a busy person, so we're, so, so we, I'm excited that he was able to take the time out of his schedule to, uh, to talk to us today. And so I'm sure you will uh, enjoy this talk. And, and, and at this point, I want to make sure I think your, 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 cameras, your camera is obviously on, your microphone's on, and go ahead and share your screen uh, and, and start your talk. Welcome, Brent, to, uh, to this workshop. And thank you again for joining us. Thank you very much, Gunter. Just check that you can, uh, that you can see well. Yeah. Yep, we okay, can great. Yep, yep. Okay, good. perfect. Great. No, th thank you very much, and, and it's uh, it's really my pleasure to to join you today for for the for the event. Um, for also be able to give a chance to to share some insights and some some of the thinking really behind uh, our net zero by twenty fifty roadmap. As you mentioned, this was uh, released last year uh, in May, and I was fortunate enough to be one of the, the lead authors. Of the report, it was really an, an agency-wide effort across all sectors and all fuels. And I'm sure the discussions here, as I've just heard a few of the presentations before, you know, every sector, every technology needs to be involved in order to make a successful transition to uh, for the economies to move towards net zero emissions by 2050 or as soon as possible. Um, so, in my remarks today, I would be be very happy just to like, I structured them in sort of a way of sort of key principles that are embedded in the net zero modeling uh, that we've done for, for our net zero roadmap. Um, so I am involved on a day-to-day -day basis in our power sector modeling for the World Energy Outlook and special reports. And so I was focused very much there, but of course the, the challenge is, is broader than that. So without uh, further delay, let me, let me jump in here. Um, let's see. So I think just to lay out those, I'd like to walk through sort of eight key principles um, with my time. So I'll go fairly quickly and happy to come back during questions. So I mean, the, the first point I think that is very relevant is including the latest data in your modeling exercises, uh, understanding what's been happening to date so that your jumping off point for any kind of roadmap and any long-term thinking is as relevant to the current conditions as possible. I would say, make sure that the models that you're using are as detailed as possible. Now, this is uh, very contingent on having the data available and, and uh, being able to, and the expertise to actually operate the models. But I think the more detail here, uh, the more important and the, the more robust the outcomes will be. A third point will be to reflect the real world constraints and overall constraints of the transition and also the preferences within, within a given country or a given region. Fourth would be build on existing policies and plans. I think those already embed many of the momentum for technology, for public acceptance that we see. So building on those and accelerating what's already in those plans uh, is quite a central piece. Be specific uh, about the steps along the way and about the particular measures, because it would also make then provide an, a metric for success or how progress is, is actually developing. 
and identifying the technologies that will be critical for the transitions, perhaps even tomorrow, and that aren't necessarily yet in place uh, is a, a very essential part, I think, of getting to long-term objectives. And then to play to one's strength. So every region, every country has its own situation, its own resource uh, availability, its own, let's say, technical expertise. So playing to your strengths in your own transition, I think, is, is quite an essential piece. And then finally, making sure that transitions are as secure, affordable, and just as possible. So I'll go through and kind of give an example uh, for each of these here. So for the, for the latest data, I think in one particular point is of course, what emissions have been doing to date. Now this is of course the global profile and I'll show it quite a few sort of global results as this was a, a global roadmap, but I'll use the our net zero roadmap as a way to demonstrate some of these principles. We've seen now that emissions had been on the rise in the 2010s, there was a tentative plateau in global emissions. 2020 saw a reduction in emissions, largely due to the global pandemic. But the latest information indicates a rebound in these global emissions in 2021. Now, that's an important jumping off point for any, any particular work looking at the future. And certainly, this is true for any country. Now, globally, this is because all fossil fuels and the use of those fossil fuels increased in 2021 from coal, natural gas to oil in the rebound uh, from the global pandemic. So unfortunately, our recovery so far has not been as sustainable as we would like. Um, and this jump in emissions already means the task ahead is going to be a bit more difficult uh, to reach net zero emissions. But it's not just emissions, of course, I think, to say that the most up-to-date technology information, whether that's costs or performance or the, the status of those technologies is quite important. Um, and of course, the, the energy balance and energy mix. So we understand what we're starting from and including also the fleet of power plants, of the industry that's there, understanding that infrastructure, which took decades to build up. What is the status of that? Are, are those young? Are they... Um, or that maybe they're aging so it'd be easier to transition away from, all very relevant for developing a roadmap. Modeling in detail, I think, is quite critical. Uh, we have been at the IEA been building up and expanding our energy modeling expertise for many years. We have the, the world energy model, is underpins all of the world, world energy outlook and underpin the net zero roadmap, where we go into quite, quite a lot of detail on in every sector and all fuels are covered. So from the demand side, you will go down to the application level. And to kind of give an example of that, we hear a lot about electrification and as a key pillar of transitions. And we certainly agree, and it's one of our seven key pillars in the net zero roadmap, but electrification is not sort of universally the same. How much can you electrify, electrify vehicles and the, the passenger vehicle fleet? versus how much you can electrify industry, the answer is different. So being able to model the energy system and the energy transitions at the application level or subsector level in detail, what are the options for reducing emissions is quite important. Here we can see the, the dots on the figure here show the degree of electrification. So how much of the consumption is coming through electricity it's rising in all these applications, but it rises by a different amount in the net zero scenario. So I think that's just to, to kind of demonstrate one aspect. As mentioned, uh, I have the luxury to be, my, my responsibility is to be focused on the power sector. So I am constantly looking at the technologies available um, and what are these alternatives for cutting emissions there. But there are many colleagues looking in other sectors from buildings to industry, to transport, to the supply side as well. How can we decarbonize the supply, potentially even of fossil fuels, um, and how can we address all of these aspects is, is quite important because to get to such an ambitious goal, all the pieces of the puzzle need to be included. Third point is on reflecting constraints. Uh, I kind of put here emissions as an example of this and overall global emissions. We've, there's been progress 
in recent years going from before the Paris Agreement, where emissions and the policies at that point were actually leading us, would have led to emissions continuing to rise at the global level and leading to global climate change that would have meant really an unlivable earth. Um, and we've been bending that emissions curve since with stated policies, and we've included also our announced pledges scenario. So we, we think in scenario terms, we're not making any kind of long-term forecasts, but these are the policies and the technologies that can change how this, the pathway forward. We see that already a lot has been done to bend this curve and that the, our updated announced pledges is even as of those pledges made at COP26, um, so all the way including uh, emission reduction targets and net zero ambition goals stated, for example, by India um, and Prime Minister Modi there. So we, we've included all of those elements and it certainly would change the course of emissions, but we see we would still be far off of a net zero emissions trajectory. So setting this constraint of how quickly do we need to reduce emissions by 2030, certainly by 2050, is a very important point. For, for us, another element, because we, want to, we wanted our net zero roadmap to limit global temperature increases to 1.5 degrees uh, with limited overshoot, this meant setting a very tight carbon budget uh, of 500 gigatons over the, over the period of 2050. So these are very critical points of knowing and setting the course, how stringent are these overall goals. Reflecting preferences is also a very important part in thinking of through these, uh, through a net zero strategy. This will certainly differ by country, um, whether technologies are well, are publicly accepted um, and embraced. Um, we're seeing that renewable energy is embraced worldwide. Uh, wind and solar PV still face some challenges um, for siting and permitting, but there are over 130 countries worldwide that have supportive policies of wind and solar PV. But beyond that, we know that hydropower can be very controversial. Nuclear power can be very controversial. Um, carbon capture technologies, there are different degrees of confidence in those technologies. Hydrogen as well. So understanding the preferences that should be reflected in a, a transition pathway are, are quite critical. So I put this slide here, comparing our net zero pathway with comparable IPCC scenario pathways, which is uh, from the AR5 report. Um, and we've just seen a, a new batch of scenarios be released in AR6. That to highlight kind of here, one of the preferences we wanted to embody sort of at the global level was a limited sustainable supply of bioenergy. So the figure on the top right there, limiting the amount of sustainable bioenergy to 100 exajoules or less. And this was really a, a preference. The, there, is a, there are various estimates of how much sustainable bioenergy there is in the world. We wanted to take a particularly conservative view here, uh, given the, the discussions ongoing there. Also how much we rely on carbon removal technologies and carbon capture. Um, there was certainly a, an indication that um, relying on those less would help express the degree of the challenge for the world uh, to, a, to a much greater degree. And on the positive side here, you see hydrogen on the, the upside, you see that we, relative to the IPC scenarios, there's quite a lot of hydrogen and hydrogen-based fuels in our net zero pathway. That's in the middle figure on the bottom, um, indicating that, which is really reflecting actually the discussions that we're seeing ongoing, where the confidence and momentum for hydrogen is much higher than when these scenarios were initially put together. And so those preferences are kind of expressed and embodied then in our net zero roadmap. As I mentioned on existing policies, it's critical sort of, we're not starting from a, a static situation. We're not starting from a blank slate. Many countries have been thinking about how to cut emissions for many years. There have been policies already put in place, regulations, the technologies are there. Some of the, the markets are starting to pick them up as well. So building on those existing policies and plans uh, 
I think gives a, makes the pathway overall more robust. So to give an idea, one way to demonstrate that is the transition in the electricity sector here um, over the next decade, looking at the generation mix. So how much electricity is being generated by coal-fired power plants that don't have carbon capture? Well, today that's the largest source of electricity in the world. But as we're going forward under announced pledges, we see that would already be coming down. We also see there'd be very strong growth for wind and solar PV. As I mentioned, this is very widely supported by policy. We now see that solar PV is one of the cheapest, if not the cheapest source of new electricity in most markets. So there's clear momentum for the low emission side and electricity to be growing. And on the flip side, looking to limit the unabated use of fossil fuels. So in the net zero pathway, we need to further accelerate this transition. Where coal-fired power generation is falling already under announced budgets, it needs to fall much further to get on the pathway towards net zero emissions by 2050. We need to phase out unabated coal uh, really over the next 15 years worldwide, so by 2035. And one of the first steps there is to stop building new coal-fired power generation, uh, if at all possible. And we think that that is, given all the other measures on energy efficiency, scaling up on the low emission side, that there, with those in mind, there's, we don't see the need for new coal-fired power plants to be built. And that's consistent also with the recent findings in the IBCC AR6 report. Being specific, I think, is challenging in a, a net zero pathway because the ambitions are so high. But I think, as mentioned, they give very clear targets then to also measure progress. One of the key elements of the net zero roadmap is that we need to take action over the next decade. We can't wait till 2030 uh, to start taking action. In some countries that will mean already cutting emissions quite significantly. In other developing economies, for example, that may mean slowing the emissions increase and plateauing and reaching a peak. Um, but in either case, we need to scale up the clean energy side. So one of those particular specific targets is to expand the deployment of wind and solar PV to over 1,000 gigawatts of new capacity added in the year 2030. That means quadrupling the market from what it was in 2020, which happens to be exactly the growth that was there in the previous decade. So it's, it is, we see that as possible and we do see signs of the uh, supply chains expanding at that rate. We also need electric vehicles to be a much larger part of the global fleet. So reaching about 60% of sales in overall passenger vehicles for uh, electric cars. So that's a, a much larger expansion from where we sit today, but trying to be very specific about that. And on the energy efficiency side, we need a metric for how much collectively all these measures mean and the progress we're making. So we need to be cutting the intensity of the economies by about 4% per year, which is about double the recent pace. So these each give clear metrics of, of what we need to do. Now, there are many more as well. And in, the, in our roadmap, we set out over 400 milestones along the way, specific to sectors and technologies. So I won't go through certainly all those even here on the screen, which is a selected set but it gives you an idea that we want to understand what we need to be doing today in the next five years, by 2030, in 2040, and ultimately how do we get to 2050 is by taking these steps along the pathway. Next, the, um, this identifying key technologies. I think we see innovation is critical to meet the ultimate objective of net zero emissions by 2050. Over the next decade, we have the technologies to cut emissions, but beyond that, we need to be bringing new ones to the market. Um, by 2050, in fact, we saw about half of the overall emission reductions needed would come from technologies that are well known, but are not yet commercially available uh, and cost competitive. So this means driving innovation in a number of areas, um, whether it's from, and here are just a few of those examples, 
to kind of touch on, on three, advanced batteries is a critical area that could, so increasing the energy density of batteries, for example, cutting their weight, cutting their cost, could open up new applications, um, including electric aviation, but it would also make electric vehicles much more affordable. Hydrogen-based fuels would certainly be a big area where we see the market need to be developed, as well as a low carbon supply chain for hydrogen uh, is another critical area. And then we also need to be thinking about carbon capture technologies, whether that's directly carbon capture for power plants or for industry or eventually carbon removal. I mentioned playing to, to their strengths and this is part of our, of the roadmap where it identifies that there are actually many parts of the global energy economy that are growing and emerging and creates huge opportunities for new technologies and possibly for new players in these technologies. So if we look at this picture, it will give a sense of the international scale um, of trade here and actually of, the, of certain industries where today, for example, oil is a much larger industry than clean technologies on an annual basis. But this is set to completely change on a net zero pathway, where over the next 30 years, you're talking at almost $1 trillion per year in this new equipment kind of area from fuel cells, electrolyzers, battery packs here you see is a huge, uh, huge growth area. And so as new countries and all the players along the way of these supply chains, there are large opportunities also to be involved and to benefit from the transitions. This final point of we need secure, affordable, and just transitions. So to run very quickly, secure transitions, we need to be thinking about everything of how, of maintaining the security we have in energy systems today and improving it. Just one example is on the electricity side where flexibility is, is really the key to maintaining electricity security. One of the big challenges is our main source of flexibility for power systems today are come from unabated fossil fuels. And we are phasing those out in a net zero roadmap. So how do we replace that? So the detailed modeling, we need to be thinking about addressing these kinds of questions. In our net zero roadmap, we have detailed hourly models of several regions to try and understand this challenge and can demonstrate that through measures like demand side response, energy storage, and other low emission sources of flexibility, we can fill this gap. We can maintain and even improve electricity security in many, in many ways. And this is true across the energy sector that the security challenges certainly don't go away and they evolve, but there are ways to, to address them. On the affordability side, we need to make sure that the choices and technologies that are deployed have the least impact then on consumers. So I heard financing in one of the previous discussions, and that's certainly a key element here that the availability of low cost financing can dramatically cut the costs of energy transitions. And in fact, we may see that in the future that the affordability of energy is improved because of the transitions themselves. The one exercise we had in the World Energy Outlook was looking at the different household energy bills and what constitutes them, as well as if there was a fuel price shock, not unlike the fuel price shock that we're seeing today in energy markets. So if natural gas prices are high, if coal prices are high, what would be the impact on households? And what we saw that in a net zero world, that households are actually protected to a large degree and insulated from the kind of price shocks that can happen and have happened, and in fact are happening right now. Um, so their affordability can be very much a positive point. It's often talked about of how much will this cost? Um, now there will be a lot of investment needed, that is for sure, but ultimately households will care about the energy bills uh, in the long run and what they need to pay on an annual basis. And so there's quite a distinction between what we need to invest versus what's the cost to consumers. And then ultimately, this need, transitions need to be equitable and just for everyone in an economy, in a, in a country. One aspect, one way to think about that is there will be a huge number of new jobs created on the clean energy front. They will more than compensate the jobs lost uh, in the fossil fuel industries, but we need to make sure that people 
are ready for those jobs, are trained for those jobs, so they have the skills necessary, and that those new jobs created are also spread widely across economies and help to lift everyone as the transitions progress. So we're addressing the emissions challenge, reaching net zero emissions by 2050. And along the way, as we think about it, we need to make sure that everyone is captured and, and a part of that positive change. But I'd stop there and uh, be happy to answer any questions and comments. Thank you very much. Thank you, Brent. Wow, great talk. Um, amazing. So, so I guess if, if I ever had any doubts that we have a huge challenge ahead of us uh, to accomplish this transition to a global net zero world, I think you just dispelled them all. <laughs> so, so I think it, it is a huge challenge, right? I mean, you look at, you look at what is needed. Um, you know, 30 years ago, when I first started doing this kind of modeling work, you know, I used to be very shy about presenting results that involved anything close to a billion, you know, you know, a billion with a B, right? And in fact, this is how we would say, billion with a B, because the most common measure in the 80s and 90s to measure investment needs were in the millions. You just said that we, in order to do this, in order to get there, we need to scale up our clean energy investments to a level of a trillion with a T per year. So that's 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 amazing. Or a scale up of like clean energy investments in wind and solar from a level of over 200 gigawatts of capacity a year to you know to a to a thousand to a tera, terawatt a year. I mean, so these are numbers that are mind-boggling, right? And so so when I saw your report first, I was really impressed, and, but at the same time, I was shocked by the scale of the problem that we have to address, right? So and, and so, but then I remember in the meeting in December, you made a comment and said something to the effect that, you know, like while these numbers are huge, you received actually often you or some I think you received some pushback that some of your assumptions were not. We're too conservative, not aggressive enough. And so maybe maybe you can elaborate on this a little bit, right? I mean, so you know, so so what was the feedback on the report? And, and, and really is there, you know, was there, you know, where do you feel like you were aggressive enough? And where were you, where, where is this their sense that you might have been even too conservative in in, in really making that transition work? I don't know. You have any thoughts on this? Yeah, sure, of course. So the no, I think you're you're very right. I mean, this is it's it is very ambitious to the pathway that, that we need. We need to act now, really, to already get on this pathway. Yeah. Um, and so I think that's one of the biggest challenges is how quickly we can scale up the industries yep. that we need. Um, so you, you mentioned the wind and solar side of quadrupling the market to a thousand gigawatts um, per year by 2030. Um, some in the industry, I will say said this was, would be very hard to do um, themselves because it's also once you start thinking of the timelines and the full supply chains, it's uh, very challenging to raise, well, really to double an industry in a decade is already pushing it. And that, this is clearly where wind and solar have, uh, have demonstrated an ability to scale up. And so they relied on very heavily in this, in this, kind, of, uh, in this kind of work in our net zero roadmap. Um, I think we've, I think we've we've found a quite a good balance because we, through the collaboration and input in the development process, we heard mostly. I mean, we heard pluses and minuses on almost all the technologies, right? That some, if if we only heard comments and feedback that this is too high and we won't be able to reach this. Um, then we were able to, to inc incorporate that already in the net zero roadmap. Um, so I think you know, another example is on the nuclear power side, the total nuclear power capacity in the net zero pathway doubles in, by 2050, so in the next 30 years, which is a, a really a kind of a rebirth almost of the nuclear industry. Now, some within the nuclear industry think it can go further. Some told us that this would be very, very difficult to achieve. So we felt we were always trying to find this balance of what are the, where are these limits um, for how quickly we can scale up? And we looked to the industries themselves uh, and communicated with them. So I, I think we, we tried to strike this balance. Now we're one year and a little 
well, almost exactly one year on from when we released it. So of course the world is also in a different place. Um, I think we, with the, the, uh, the war in Ukraine um, and the changes that we're seeing in global markets that are related to that, there are some changes already in, in acceptance and perceptions of different technologies. So there's more positive discussion about nuclear power, for example, uh, in several countries. There are also this recognition of what, what could long-term natural gas prices be? Are we in for a more continued period of, of high prices? And coal prices are also very high. Some of these pieces will like help accelerate uh, the transitions. A lot of the discussion is about how do we scale up renewables even faster? Now, I think for me, that gives me more confidence in this, the kind of numbers that we have in the net zero roadmap for renewables, for example. It does mean there are some changes. I think the role of gas as a bridge in the near term, substituting for coal in the power sector and industry, uh, we would probably look to that less um, because this is again, sort of incorporate the latest data, right? This is the, the first principle. So it's always going to be a bit moving, but I think the big pieces, the big pillars of the roadmap remain quite solid. Um, and there's also been very good progress on the hydrogen side we're seeing a lot of projects being proposed and put forward. And some of the real nitty gritty questions of how do we reduce the risk for these projects is, is kind of the conversation we're hearing now, which is quite different than it was a year ago, which is further along towards implementation. So I think there are, uh, as always, there are quite a few things on the positive side and a few things on the negative side. Um, but um, in, on balance, I think we are quite happy with how the, the net zero roadmap has aged one year. And uh, yeah. Perfect, thank you. So uh, I'm, looking at the, uh, I'm looking at the chat. So we have a couple of questions there. So, so related to the scale up, uh, I think there is a question that relates to the supply chains that are needed to scale up um, these, these, these markets and industries. Um, and I, I believe your report addresses that, right? So, so, so maybe you want to just speak briefly towards that a little bit. Sure, yeah, absolutely. The supply chain, so we, we had the consideration of what, where do we get all this material? Where do we get the steel? Where do we get the aluminum or aluminum for Americans on the call? Uh, where, do we, where do we get the cement? How do we produce this? So there's internally, it's consistent within the modeling, which is uh, no small feat, and um, I think is also a kind of a modeling point that it's quite important to reflect these feedbacks as much as possible. Um, but the full thinking through the supply chains and all the steps, we are actually going to release an additional report in the coming months on that particular question. So a much deeper dive. Um, we're taking the net zero roadmap and in many ways, uh, fleshing out some of these details which um, you know, deserve more attention and deserve more consideration. And so at exactly this question on supply chains, particularly for, for those pillars, for renewables, for hydrogen, for electrification, what does this actually mean in kind of in more, in more direct terms? Um, so I, would, uh, I wouldn't wanna jump in front of that. So I, that, a point to that will come out in October, November this year, specifically on supply, change, supply chains in our energy technology perspectives series. Okay. Perfect. Um, there's a few, I mean, there's a whole bunch of them, but I'll, I'll just take one more in the interest of time. So, so maybe perhaps after your talk, just, um, you know, uh, take a look and see if you can briefly address those in the chat form. Uh, so one of them has to do with the uh, um, EV, uh, the transportation sector. So, so I think in, in one of your slides, you show the electric car sales projected to go up by a factor of 18. So 20, 20 times scale up. And so, so this was just showed electric car sales. I guess the question is more related to EV transportation. So what's the, um, you know, what's, what's the balance between personal private transportation versus uh, uh, public transportation? Is there consideration for that as well within the transportation sector? Yeah, but behavior change was a, a major consideration in our, in our roadmap overall, and it relates very much on the transportation side. So that what I've often called modal shift. Um, yep. So having the ability to go, yeah, to moving away from private, uh, private transportation where possible. So I think very clearly there can be a big impact from those kind of behavioral changes. 
whether it's in transport, whether it's in home heating, for example. I mean, something that's come up very recently, of course, is how do you reduce gas use in a hurry? You know, one of those ways is turning down your, your thermostats in your household by one degree Celsius has a big impact on even a regional amount of gas demand. Um, but this kind of behavioral change is there. So it certainly we're seeing also the rise of autonomous vehicles, which could, if they're not electric, could have a concern of actually raising emissions there. But public transport, whether it's electric buses, um, but also hydrogen possibly could play there. That public transport and train systems, which are quite efficient, all of these can be a, a very effective way to cut emissions in transportation. We, it doesn't just have to be a one, one for one internal combustion engine car to an electric vehicle. Um, where certainly short trips, for example, within cities can have a big impact on air pollution as well. So there are a lot of co-benefits of energy transitions and these kind of choices then, whether it's to an electric vehicle, to public transportation or cycling or walking, um, can have a big knock-on effect then on cutting emissions of CO2, but also pollutants improving health impacts in, in major economies really, well, in economies around the world. Actually. Super. All right, well, thank you so much, Clint. Um, in the interest of time, we'll, uh, we'll move on, but I, I know there's um, other questions. So again, so maybe in the break, take, see, see if you can answer address a few of them uh, and, and we'll make an effort of that. So if you, uh, if, you if you have not had a chance to download this report, I highly recommend you do so. Uh, you'll find it easily if you Google it or you go through the IEA website. Uh, net zero by 2050, a global roadmap to uh, decarbonization. So, uh, and, and I've, there's a wealth of data you can download too. It's all for free. I downloaded all the results, Excel files, and I use it all the time in my presentation. So it's, 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 it's uh, there, there's a wealth of information that's to go to the website and find that data. It's, it's, it's really impressive. And so we appreciate you taking the time to join us today for the workshop. Um, thank you very much, and uh, we'll break for five minutes, and then we'll have our next speaker for the last session, Todd Levin, being introduced by Clarice. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Brent, again, and thank you, everyone, for joining this morning. We'll be back in about five minutes. Thank you all. Take care.